Good evening, good evening, good evening, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. How y'all doing this evening? Thank you for uh, joining us here at St. Francis with Glory in God, where the Honorable George H. Perry is the pastor. I am your course facilitator. And it's Porter. And tonight, we are going to look at Nehemiah chapter 1, depending on God. This must be a very important message for somebody because I've hit delay after delay after delay. Every frustration that I could possibly have without losing my cool has almost occurred. So, with that being said, let us go to our Father in prayer and let's depend on God. Most High God, O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen without delay. For your city and your people that are called by your name. You are who you say you are. You can do what you say you can do. I am who you say I am. I can do all things through Christ. Your word is alive and active in me. Most high God. The creator of the heavens and the earth, and the fullness thereof, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, all there is, all there was, all there will be, the Almighty. Gracious Father, we come now asking for your peace. I'm depending on you to get us through this lesson tonight, Father. Well, I'm thanking you for your grace, mercy, and love, your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, joy, peace, and purity. Courage, healing, and strength. Abundance, awareness, and expansion. Most of all, Father, I thank you for your Son, Jesus, who went to the cross and shed his blood for the remission of our sin and salvation of our soul. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who dwells and abides within me each and every day. Now, Father, I ask you to forgive us for we have all fallen short of your will and your glory. But hallelujah, 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 there is none greater than you. Now, Lord, speak to me, speak through me, that each of our souls may be uplifted as we talk about depending on you, the Most High God, the Creator of all, the one that knew from the end and brought it back to the beginning, the one who has destined each one of us for our past. Father, we just ask you to touch us, deliver us. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. All right. Dependent on God. Monday night, we learned a little bit about who Nehemiah is. The cupbearer. He was set apart to be the governor of um, Jerusalem when he went back to Jerusalem. And then only a few people, well not a few people, everyone did not return to Jerusalem with him. So now, let's look at our lesson. The author writes, at one time or another, most of us I have said, I am too busy to pray. If the work of God depended on our energy and our insight, then it might be true. But of course, at least theoretically, we believe that God's work can only be done through His power. Psalm 127 and 1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, it's builders labor in vain. Yet, we don't think our biggest job is to pray. How do you respond when you hear bad news about people that you know and that you care about? How do you respond? What's your first reaction? Is it one of prayer, keeping people in prayer? Is it one of sympathy? Is it one of empathy? Is it one of better them than me? Think about it. How do you, how do you, how do you work? How do you, how do you respond when someone you truly care about is in a bad situation?
pray first. Amen. That is the correct answer. That's what we ought to do. Pray first. Pray first. All right. Now, how quickly do you identify with the problems of your friends? When you know people that's always, oh, woe is me, the sky is falling, everything is bad, nothing is ever good, how do you relate to those? We're going to break this question down into a few more people. Pieces. How do you relate to those people that are always negative? Then, how do you relate to the one that is hardly ever negative, and when they present a problem, they have a real problem? And then the third category is the one that's got a serious problem, but tries to keep their mouth shut as long as they can. I ain't talking about nobody in particular. I'm like that as well. There's some things I really don't want to discuss until I have an idea of what's going on. Amen. But how do you how do you deal with each one of those categories? I know the one that's always nagging, always complaining about something wrong. I tend really not to him too much. Because that is their constant state of being. If things were to be perfect with them, if they woke up in the morning, 82 degrees with a nice breeze, just enough cloud cover for it not to be too hot, not to be too cool, they had the exact amount of money in the bank that they needed, had the exact amount of cash that they needed, driving the car that they wanted to drive, if they had children, all their children were behaving the way they were supposed to behave. The birds were singing. And everything was perfect. Those people would find something wrong with that day. First thing out of their mouths would be, this day is too perfect. Something got to go wrong. Uh, what's your reaction to that person? Then the one that's moderate, the moderate one that doesn't complain a whole lot, but will mention that something's going on, but they get up and they acknowledge the day as it is, don't look for anything that's wrong and go head on. And then you have that third person, the one that's in a living hell, gets up, greets the sunshine with a smile, Embrace the day, get their breakfast, whatever it is they're going to get, go sit outside and enjoy the sunshine and thank God for what they have. Now, how do you embrace that person when they tell you that they are in a living hell? Reflect on that for a minute and then tell me what y'all think. And how would you respond to that? How do you respond to that? How do you respond to that? Still pray first, Dawn? 
You gonna pray first for all three of them? Tell them I love them, pray for them. Okay. Alright. So as we go before the Lord in prayer, we discover his perspective and we gain confidence. Maybe that we could make a difference. Maybe we could make it that would make a difference in what we try to accomplish for the Lord. In this study, Nehemiah not a, models dependency on the Lord for his strength. Let's take a listen to Nehemiah 1. So now, when we look at that, what, what events are they talking about in verses 1, 2, and 3? What's being discussed in verse 1, 2, and 3? Now, it happened in the month of Chesvia, in the 20th, 20th year, as I was in Susa at the citadel, that Hanai, one of my brothers came to, with certain men from Judea, Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile concerning Jerusalem. He said, then they said to me, the remnant there in the province who has survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem is broken, broken down, and the gates are destroyed by fire. What are they talking about? What events are they talking about? Jerusalem was in bad shape. The people in Jerusalem were in bad shape. The walls were broken down and the gates were destroyed by fire.
and the remnant of the providence were in great trouble and shame. So it was, had a lot going on. They had a lot going on. Rebuilding the wall. Amen. So what four things did Nehemiah do when he hears Hanis report? What four things did he do? He wept, he mourned, fasted, and he prayed. Wept and mourned, fasted and prayed. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and I mourned. And I continued fasting and praying before the Lord of heaven. Okay? Fasted, prayed, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Wept, mourned, fasted, and prayed. Now, let's look at verses 5 through 11. What are Nehemiah's concerns in his prayers? What did Nehemiah talk about specifically in his prayers? O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you, before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, and we have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. But if you return to me, I will keep and keep my commandments and do them. Through though you, your outcasts are in the utmost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place where I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sights of men, of this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. What was his concerns? His primary concerns. What was Israel doing? What did Israel do? What did he say he did? He was praying for the sin that they had committed against God. That was his biggest concern. Well, one of his biggest concerns. Then he reminded God of what God said. He reminded God. Uh, let's see what he said. That. He reminded God. But if you be if you are faithful, I will scatter you amongst the people. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the utmost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. He remind God, he remind God of his promise. He's concerned about the sin that's being committed, the sin that he and his household has committed, the sin that Israel's committed. But then he reminded God, but God, you said, think about when you had children or think about when you were a kid and your parents promised you something. What's the first thing out your mouth? But you said, 
And guess what? It's okay for us to remind God what he said. When you remind God what he says, what does that show? That you are in alignment, that you have a relationship with him because you are reading the word. You have an understanding of the word so you can repeat back to him what he said. But if you haven't read the word and you don't know what the scripture says, you can't tell him what he said. And you cannot, for lack of a better way of putting this, you can't hold him accountable to his word. <laughs> And I said lack of a better way because we can't hold God accountable. But we can remind him of his promise. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did. He reminded him of his promise. Remember the word that you commanded. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, Father, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't forget what you said. You said if we faithful, if we are unfaithful, you will scatter us among the people. Well, we've been that now. Now, but hey, we try to get it together. Can we come home? You said, if, you, we, if we get it together and do like you said do, you will bring us back to the place that you chose. How do you see the various elements of prayer being used here? Consider the four parts. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Where's the adoration in his prayer? Oh God. Oh God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and hear and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. That I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. That's the adoration. That's the adoration. Adoration basically means to adore to show honor and respect. Our Father, which art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. That is adoration. Heavenly Father, I bow to you. That is adoration. God, you are who you say you are. You can do what you say you can do. It's our statement of faith, but we are showing our adoration to who he is. And then we accept our place. I am who you say I am. That's putting him in his position of sovereignty and authority and putting us in our submissive permission of being the created creature. I pray now, night and day, for your servants, your servants. Then there's the confession. Confession. Confessing the sins of the people of Israel which have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, and we have not kept your commandments, kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded, your servant Moses. And the service Moses, servant Moses. He didn't come out and say the words thank you. But he acknowledged who God was and he acknowledged the fact that I am your servant. And I am grateful for the words that you've given us. And we have not followed those words. Remember. Remember the word that you commanded your servant. That's when we begin the supplication. When he's asking for what it is he wants. So when you pray, you're praying in four parts. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, 
and your supplication. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Adoration. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our confession. Our confession and the thanksgiving. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us our supplication. Okay? All right. Are you using these forms of prayer in your prayer life? If not, why? And if you have not been taught how to pray properly, it's okay. You can always go back to the model prayer. You can always go back to the model prayer. That's why Jesus taught, as they say in the Catholic Church, the Our Father. That's why it is the Lord's Prayer. It covers everything that you need to cover. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our trespasses. So when we are asking, when we are asking him to forgive us for what we've done, then we can be forgiven for what we have done. Lead us not. That's our supplication. Okay? And if you have any further questions on how to break down your prayer and put it into the four parts where you don't, where you're not able to use the model prayer, I will be glad to help you out whenever you need to. What evidence do you find here that Nehemiah believed that he heard his prayer and he would answer it? What makes you think that he, Nehemiah's prayer is going to be answered? He's just talking. He's just talking to God a form of prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Just talking to God is a form of prayer. I'm a person that prays a lot. And in my prayers, it's not always a formal bowing down. I do have my time set aside where there is a kneeling. There is a prostrate period where that I am in total submission. But when I'm driving, there's a conversation going on. There's prayer. Sometimes when I'm dealing with people that I really don't want to deal with, there's a lot of prayer going on. So just having a conversation with God is prayer. Just make sure it's two-sided. So some of us like to talk, but we don't listen. We want to tell God what we want him to do, and we got to keep in mind, we are the creature, he is the creator. He already know what he has planned for us. All we got to do is stick with the plan. When I look at this, when I look at the prayer itself, the way he formed his prayer, when he reminded God of what God said, when he used God's words, God's going to honor his word. That's the evidence to me. When we use God's words, when you hear me repeat Jeremiah 29, 11, God, you know your plans for me, your plans to prosper, prosper me. That means whatever you got planned, you know what the goodness is. You know what's supposed to be done. And since it's your plan, I can't change your plan. There's only one, there's only one of us that can make your plan work. And that's you. So when I repeat that back to him, I'm repeating that back specifically because you said it. Or what did we say earlier? Uh, Daddy, wait. That, you said it. But you said it. How many parents do not 
truly want to honor the word that they give to their child. Even the worst parent tries to honor as much of their word as they can. Try. But now we're talking about the perfect father. We go to the book of Isaiah. He's not a man. He, ain't got, he, he can't lie. He's not a man. He can't lie. He don't need to lie. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. Because we don't understand what he's doing don't mean a thing. We weren't there when he planned our lives. <laughs> I'm laughing because it's funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> he wrote a book, he wrote a script, and he go, your life, go live it. This is where you're going to end up. These are all your possible choices. But this is where you're going to end up at. Let's see how you work it. Nehemiah, Nehemiah got more confident as he prayed and as he fasted. How does this compare? How did this to prepare him to get more involved? Why? Why do you believe? Why do you think he got more confident in fasting and praying? What did he develop while fasting and praying? Strength. He developed strength. Not so much that he developed strength. When you fast, ooh, thank you. When you're fasting, guess what you're doing? You're getting rid of unneeded baggage. And when you get rid of unneeded needed baggage, you don't necessarily have to get stronger. You just ain't got other stuff weighing you down. So as he started to get rid of that other baggage, he could feel himself able to move a little bit better and move a little bit stronger. As we fast and pray and we begin to shed unnecessary baggage, we begin to be able to see and we begin to understand what it is we need to do and then we should become more confident. The beauty of going to the gym is not so much that you build a whole lot of muscle, you get rid of a whole lot of fat. What good is fat? What does it do? Sometimes it adds a little flavor to some meat. But if you eat too much of it, it clogs your arteries. It's nothing but grease. If you have too much on, if you have too much on your body, it slows you down and makes you sluggish. But when you start to lose extra stuff, if you don't have a whole lot of extra stuff to carry, you can move a little better. Your mind is clearer because you're not fatigued. When you are tired, when you got too much on your mind, when you got a whole lot of extra stuff you're trying to carry, you don't always make good decisions. You make decisions to make your life easier. Well, what do I mean? Well, I mean, if you have not prepared your life for this point, where you are, if you're not prepared for this point in your life where you are, you try to find the easiest way out. But when you've done everything that you were supposed to do, everything that mom and daddy tried to teach you to do, everything that you learned along the way to help your life be better, you don't look for the easy way out. You don't worry about trying to take a shortcut. If you're in a marathon, if you train for that marathon, you're not going to try to find a way to cut off 10 miles. You're going to run all 26.2 miles. Whether you come in first or whether you come in last, because you prepared for it. And because you prepared for it, you want the reward for the work that you have done. But when you have not prepared for things, you try to take every shortcut that you can find to try to get the reward because you don't want the responsibility that comes with the reward. 
So when we fast and we pray, we lose all of the extra baggage, the unnecessary stuff, or the stuff that is clouding our vision. We get a clear mind, we can see, and we can hear better because we don't have all the outside noise pushing in on us. So then we can move. Nehemiah got more confident because he was clearing off. He was, mm, he was getting the junk out of his closet. Think about when you go in your closet, your cabinets, and take all that stuff out that you don't need. How much extra room do you have? And you begin to find things that you really can use when you don't have that junk in there that you don't need. That's what fasting is, getting rid of junk. And then praying in is bringing in good nutrition. In other words, we throw away all the clothes that don't fit, now we can go out and buy some new wardrobe. Get rid of all them shoes from 1932, so now we can get some shoes from 2022. We got all those shoes stacked up in the corner that we haven't worn, but they just taking up space and full of dust. We got a whole lot of stuff on the inside of us that's just taking up space. That's why we need to fast. That's why he fasted. That's why he got stronger. And that's why he was prepared to go forward. When we fast, when we pray, we lose stuff we don't need. We get clarity and we begin to move a whole lot better. Now, how does this compare with what you've experienced in prayer? How does this compare to what you have experienced in prayer? If you haven't fasted, you ought to try it. Maybe not for three or four days at a time, maybe a half a day. Maybe not just a full water fast or no food, no water fast. Maybe you just need to cut out chocolate. Maybe you need to cut out bologna sandwiches. Need to give up something. Need to give up something. Something that is not doing your body any good. Something that's not doing your mind any good. And see how you begin to feel a whole lot different. And when you begin to feel different, you begin to think different. What's the difference between a champ and a chump, other than the letter A and the letter U? The champion knows what it takes to win. They're willing to go that extra mile. They're willing to give up whatever it is they need to give up to remain in that championship position. But the chump don't care. He's looking for every shortcut he can find to try to get to where the champ is. Well, my brothers and my sisters, there are no shortcuts. A two-week journey became 40 years because folks tried to take a shortcut. Whenever you keep seeing something over and over and over again in your life, you've tried to take a shortcut and you have not passed that test. When you pass that test, you'll move on. The University of God, the Christ School of Graduation. Now, what did you learn about Nehemiah's character from his reaction and his prayer? His first reaction was he wept and he mourned. Then he immediately went to fasting and praying. What did we learn about his character? loved his people and he loved God. He immediately apologized for what he had done wrong. He apologized for his father's house. He apologized for the whole nation of Israel. He had a contrite heart. So now, think about your ministry. Are there any reports you're hearing 
that you need to petition God for? My answer is always. Always. I always have. I personally always have something to petition God for. And then I always hear prayers here and there. Hear prayer requests here and there. So yes, always. What about y'all? What will you do? What will you do to take a risk and become a part of the answer for that prayer? Hmm. What will you do to take a risk and become a part of the answer for that prayer? You know what you're praying for. You know what you need. What are you going to do in order to make that happen? All right. Pastor, you got some uh, notes over there? No, I'm good. I'm good. All right. Yes, sir. All right. So um, Wednesday, we will pick up in the planning process. Every day I ask for a favor. <laughs> Amen. 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 Instead of asking for a favor, just ask for a favor. Get all the favor, not a favor. Get it all. He wants you to have it. You don't get it all because you don't ask for it. Wednesday, we will begin the planning process. The planning process. Nehemiah 2. All hearts and minds clear? Let us go to our Father in prayer. Most high God, in the name of Jesus, we come now saying thank you. Thank you for being the Father in the midst. Thank you for speaking to me and speaking through me. Thank you for touching hearts and minds tonight, Father. We ask you to continue to touch hearts, souls, and minds to understand and develop a relationship with you. You are the great I am. There is none before you. There will be none after you. Father, we know there is no way to you but through Christ Jesus. Father, we ask you to open our hearts and minds to receive the Shira HaMessiah and the Holy Spirit this evening, Father, and go forth in the name of Jesus. We ask you to touch the President of the United States, the Governor of Texas, the State House, the State Senate, the U.S. Congress. Father, we ask you to be with all the people in the Ukrainian conflict, Father. Bless the ones that are being bombed. Bless the ones that are being discriminated. Be with them this evening, Father, in the name of Jesus. We ask you to touch our county officials. We ask you to touch the school boards, Father. We ask you to touch the mayors and the city councils. Father, bless each and every person that's on this, that's listening and participating tonight, Father. And bless each and every person that watches it later. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Good night, y'all. See you Wednesday.